This is the United States. This is the results of the 2016 presidential election in the United States as far as relative strength of each candidate. To win the presidency outright, a candidate must get 270 electoral votes or more. In 2016, despite getting around 3 million fewer votes than his opponent, the current president of the United States, one Donnie Boy Trump, managed to get over 300 electoral votes by winning key states. Slim margins in just the right places. This is also the United States. And this is also the result of the 2016 presidential election in the United States, as far as relative strength of each candidate goes, but with three very minor differences compared to the first map. On this map, Hillary Clinton would have gotten 280 electoral votes, more than enough to become president. The difference in this map is that not a single person changed how they voted on election day. The difference is which state they were voting in. Because in America, politics is strongly linked to geography, often to the detriment of the people. But this video is not about the Electoral College. Yes, Electoral College should have been ended over a century ago. And yes, I'd probably do a video about it specifically at some point. But this video is about geography specifically, and how changing who gets to vote with who matters as much or more than what people actually want. This is the state of Ohio. This is the state of Ohio's federal congressional districts. You may notice that this is a very complicated map. Notice in the middle the funny blue blob. This is one congressional district drawn to pack as many Democratic voters into a single district as possible. See on the lower left, amongst the relatively straight lines, there is this funny meandering border between two districts that are both quite red. These districts represent the Cincinnati metro area. The southwesternmost county, where most of Cincinnati is, Hamilton County, tends to vote Democratic by a modest but fairly consistent amount. However, the city has no federal Democratic representatives. That's very interesting, isn't it? That weird squiggly line is why. The city has been cracked into two different districts. The left-leaning voters of the city are divided up and put into two, well, technically three, different districts that have large numbers of conservative voters elsewhere in order to offset their votes, to make sure that their votes don't matter. See along the top of the state, the bunch of blue on the coast? Well, that's not three or four districts between Toledo and the western suburbs of Cleveland. That's just one single district. Another example of packing. There are only four Democratic-leaning districts in the whole state, and 12 Republican-leaning ones. You'd think that in a state that is considered a swing state, with only perhaps a slight Republican lean, that the numbers would be a little bit more even. Of the 16 districts, that maybe 9 would be Republican typically, and 7 Democratic. But that isn't the case. Not even in 2018, when the vote was split 52-47% to 47 between the two major parties. It had the same partisan results in 2016, when the Republicans were romping the statewide 58-42. to 42. And the same at the previous cycle when Republicans were doing a little bit better. What about 2012, when the percentages were 50% to 47%? Same map, same results. No change, election after election, despite some pretty large swings in the state. Because again, these districts were designed to give these specific results. They were not designed to change hands when people change their minds. They were not designed to respond to shifts to the popular sentiment. They were designed to always give the Republican Party a 3 to 1 advantage in representation in the state, and Ohio is far from alone. In some states, like Pennsylvania, the situation has been so bad that people were actually able to uh, go to the courts and to sue to overturn the partisan maps since the last round of redistricting after the previous census. Other states persist in their party-friendly maps. Some of these partisan maps have been deemed sufficiently legal as well. And with a conservative majority Supreme Court at the end of the line, the likelihood of a court case going to the federal level that might require fairer maps, just in general across the country, is unlikely for as long as conservatives are the overwhelming benefactors of partisan redistricting. But not all states suffer this problem. After all, there are some states that only have one congressional district. Okay, but maybe that's not really a victory against this sort of thing. But other states have normally nonpartisan redistricting methods in place, or ones that have stringent requirements that prevent or discourage partisan influence. 
One example is Iowa, shown here, which has four districts with no squiggly lines. There's, there are no cities being carved up to crack the voting base or packed to shore up otherwise marginally conservative districts. In the last election, when the voters changed their mind, two, almost three seats flipped. Iowa has a couple of advantages over Ohio as far as avoiding partisan map drawing. Iowa has, for example, has a much smaller population, and that allows for rules to avoid county splits to be maintained without issue. But good redistricting systems aren't only a small state thing. For instance, California has an independent redistricting method in place. This method came in the form of a California Citizens Redistricting Commission, and it gets to draw the maps for the state. It is made up of five Democrats, five Republicans, and four people not affiliated with either major party. It was created by one of those voter initiatives that California does on occasion all the way back in 2008, just in time for the last round of redistricting. The commission, once it exists and has members, needs to follow a few specific rules when it draws its maps. It handles maps for not just the U.S. Congress, but also the state Senate and Assembly, so one of the rules they must follow applies to just those. But the rest are pretty straightforward. First rule, population equality. One person, one vote, in essence. This is a requirement that goes beyond just the explicit rules of the commission, as it is also a requirement made for each congressional district within each state from the federal level. Another federal contingent rule is the second one, which is that they gotta follow the Federal Voting Rights Act. This specifically means that they gotta make sure minorities have sufficient opportunity to elect candidates of their choice. This sometimes means that, due to geography of where people live, some districts end up being mandated to pack districts to make sure that my, such a minority group has my majority of the vote in that district so they may even get their specific representation. This prevents intentional or accidental diluting of the minority vote, which, surprise, the U.S. has had a bit of history with over the centuries. But this video is not about the Voting Rights Act specifically, so I'll move on. Geographic continuity is required so that each district is a single unified area and not a collection of disjointed pieces that don't actually touch. A pretty standard rule. Even Ohio has to follow this one. Like that northern district I mentioned, it technically does have continuity, it just has it over water. Now the next item in California's rules is geographic integrity. That means, sort of like with Iowa, that you gotta respect borders to minimize divisions of cities, counties, and neighborhoods, and communities. The latter two requires a bit of research, though. But the first two are pretty straightforward. The county and city rule isn't necessarily possible in Los Angeles, though. Hence, an interest in keeping communities unified, be they large or small, together as a further subunit to the official lines on a map. This limitation reduces the ability of a commission, or really anybody that has to follow a similar rule, to draw a map for partisan advantage. There are still ways to do it, but it makes it fundamentally more difficult. Geographic impact is also a rule for California. This avoids cases of, well, we have this community contained within a third of a district on this side of the state, and this one in another third of the other, and we just connect up the two low population areas, we, we can make a district that links these totally unrelated groups. This rule discourages that sort of antic. And finally, the last big rule is to nest state and senate assembly districts, as already mentioned. Not super relevant for the federal stuff, but actually important for the state level. There is some beauty in this design of a, of a redistricting process. Consideration is being put into preserving communities and the political interests of the people. The commission has had restrictions placed upon it against considering politicians, incumbent or potential, or political parties when they make their maps. They also got to do it out in the open. No secret effort that pops out a map in the dead of the night just to be secretly put into place when no one's paying attention. There was, during the first use of this process, efforts in the public process for partisan influence to try to influence members of the commission. And it's very likely that such influence was successful to a degree. However, like with Ohio, we can measure to a degree how rigidly partisan the results of that influence was. In 2012, the first election after the map was put into place, Democrats picked up four seats while winning the popular vote 61% to 37%. Now, California has some quirks as far as elections go, as in the general election, there are only ever two candidates on the ballot, so you only have two choices. And those two candidates are determined by a blanket primary that includes all candidates from all parties. 
So there are districts where no candidate from one major party made it to the second round. This rule was approved in 2011 and so is very relevant for the rest of the elections where the commission maps were in place. It also makes the popular vote less useful as in six of these races there was no Republican and in two of them there was no Democrat. So I'll forego further uh, popular vote talk for California unless necessary in terms of raw percentages. Because generally the total numbers of Democrats will be inflated through this quirk of election law and the voting habits of the state in general. In 2014, one seat changed hands, the 31st district going from Republican to Democrat. The vote in the district shifted only marginally when the incumbent Republican retired, and that was enough for a change of party control. Remember that incumbency has historically helped parties keep control of marginal seats. You got a representative already in, they seem to be doing all right, so people tend to leave them in place. In 2016, with a small increase of support to, towards the Democrats, no seats changed hands in the entire state. But in 2018, with a small, similar increase, seven changed control as multiple seats were won by Democrats with very thin margins. On the same map, in a state with strong partisan lean, between 2012 and 2018, there was a shift of eight total seats from one party to the other. And during that time, there were substantial shifts in the raw vote total as well, of at least half a million from one party to the other. Even with the quirk of electoral system in the state, this suggests a fundamental shift in the voting preferences in the state of California between 2012 and 2018. Yes, the state overall was very, already very left-leaning, but it has become more so over time, especially under the cloud of the current Republican paradigm. So California, with its independent uh, means to draw districts despite its partisan lean, has been more responsive to shifts in voter preference compared to a state like Ohio. Ohio, a state with more mild partisan lean as far as voters goes, but a much more partisan redistricting process, has been rigid. I have resisted to speak the word gerrymander explicitly up until this point, as I, for starters, didn't want to get people riled up on how to pronounce it. I don't care. But also, I wanted to look explicitly at the responsiveness of these examples without the buzzword in place. To let you, the viewer of this video, to take in the information without tipping to the point, part of the brain that you may react strongly to such a term until such a time as I had a chance to lay out some of my evidence. But it is the term that can be properly used to describe the map of Ohio, and much less so in descriptions of what's going on in California. If California had a different set of rules in place, then easily all 53 congressional districts could have been drawn to elect Democrats from 2012 to 2018. That didn't happen. The map would, of course, be a mess, but it is doable given the millions of more Democratic voters in the state compared to Republicans. We're talking two to one ratios here at this point. They could have easily established a 50 to 3 map or a 48 to 5 map, but after several cycles of good elections and hundreds of thousands of people changing their minds, they haven't even managed to get things that lopsided under the system that is actually in place. Meanwhile, in Ohio, it doesn't really matter where you are or who you vote for. The map has been you know, drawn to make sure that all the right kind of partisan voters are in the right place to secure perpetual job security for their incumbents, to secure the job security of Republican Party politicians. And the people have taken notice of how ridiculous this frozen representation is, how unrepresentative it is of the people, how unresponsive it is to the change in the mood of the electorate. And so in 2018, they passed a state constitutional amendment to try to fix some of the issues with an overwhelming majority. This amendment was actually a compromise pushed by the state legislature, which is Republican controlled. Yes, it was bipartisan, but... It was also an attempt to scourge a more complete redistricting reform effort underway via petition. So maybe we shouldn't be as excited by what they passed. After all, this amendment keeps the power of the final map choice still in partisan hands. It just adds some special conditions and rules, some of which resemble those of California. For instance, it limits uh, county splits between districts, seeks compactness, contiguousness, all that sort of thing. But instead of a fully independent commission, this one has a series of opportunities for a bipartisan plan. And if those opportunities fail, the state legislature just draws the map for the next two elections. And if it fails again after that, well, 
another four years with legislative withdrawn maps that just might be the same map if they pass it all over again. And then just two more years until the next reapportionment. So they could just kick the can down the road however often as they like, trying the most absurd gerrymanders imaginable without recourse. So the strategy here for the Republicans in the end is to maintain partisan control of the map making process to put some limits on such to prevent a more complete deep partisan of the process to keep the final say on who draws the maps in the hands of Republican politicians and not in the Democrats, not in a bipartisan commission, not even in the people's hands in the Republican politicians control. Because as I hope I've demonstrated where you draw the line when it comes to American politics matters. And those who draw the lines can either build a playing field that is representative of the will of the people, or they can build a playing field that is totally unresponsive to the will of the voter. I'm going to show you another map now. This is a map of New Mexico that I made. It has, you know, pretty close to population equality and all three districts. The difference between the districts is a couple of hundred. The map only splits one county and otherwise follows county lines. Two of the districts are majority Hispanic and is also a horribly unfair map. You see that one county split lets me crack the city of Albuquerque in such a way as to ensure a strong democratic majority in all three districts. A majority that is highly unresponsive to change in the political winds. How about another map? One for the Republicans, perhaps. Here's Kansas. Again, only one county split, and a very minor one to shift just a thousand some people into the Green District. A split that could probably be ignored. Like the New Mexico districts, these districts seem quite reasonable on the outside. However, like the ones I did for New Mexico, these districts are very likely to get, always give Republicans majorities Every election, as the partisan lean for each is over 10% in the Republicans' favor. I created both these maps to show that one can yet create a highly partisan map without making it look excessively ugly. Building a state with squiggles and meandering districts makes it easier to do, especially in large states with geographically expansive partisan voting groups that one might be wanting to split up or in power, but it is also very possible to do it without that sort of obvious tell. Intent of the map makers is important and will inform the voting flexibility of the resulting map. Remember, Ohio and California have a lot of crazy looking districts, but one is responsive to the voters and the other is not. So I guess watch out for partisan redistricting efforts that hide their partisan plans by, say, conforming to some of the standard demands of the reform advocates. I highly suspect that we'll run into Republicans yelling about how it is totally unfair that the, their obviously partisan map is called in out as an obviously partisan map, as it just happens to follow the minimum best practices for redistricting. So how about we push for reforms where those who make the maps, who draw these lines, are actually impartial? Or I don't know, maybe move to electoral system where they don't matter. Eh. Now here's the part of the video where I was going to go into a long run down the current organizations and efforts to entrench public majorities in state houses and to steal back uh, Congress through map making. But I'll give you a quicker rundown. And that is this. Organizations like the American Legislative Exchange Council, remember those guys from a previous video, are campaigning hard to get people in place in state houses and to push their plans through the state, those state houses. The National GOP is also on the case to fund and recruit uh, for this. And of course, the current administration in the White House is trying to manipulate the census to undercount the number of people in Democratic-leaning areas. They are already got themselves a stolen Supreme Court seat to make sure the Supreme Court doesn't rule against them, so there's that as well. And they've already taken steps to remove and disrupt those who seek to prevent corrosive partisan gerrymandering in several states already. So we got all that kind of pushing to keep on these bad trends. So what can you do about it? For starters, even if it might seem bleak, Vote, and get your friends to vote, especially the non-voting kind, and get them to support politicians who are for non-partisan redistricting, and get them to vote against those who support or otherwise benefit from partisan maps drawn by their party, and find, or if it's start, or reform efforts in your locality or state 
that pushes for nonpartisan map making. This is a very long term problem, and it is one that we all need to work on together. The fronts are many and varied. Each state is different, after all. But given how much effort is put into preventing any reform effort, one thing should be pretty clear. If we are successful at all, then the current entrenched power can be disrupted, and our government can be made more responsive to us, the people. And I like to think that's a good thing. Only together can we save our democracy. So let's get to work. When I started making this script, it was before a lot of different bits of news that have come out about parts of GMAN gerrymandering. Um, so this is the part of the video where I go off script and just sort of talk. So if I sound a little beandery, that's what's going on. It's, there's weirdly enough, so much news. I kind of gave up trying to sort it all, including it in the, the video. Hence my shorter rather than longer rundown of all the, the organizations and forces trying to work against reform. I might have to rewrite that section a few times, <laughs> but, uh, the, the, the end result, though, I think, is that there is a growing awareness in the people, and I'm hoping to contribute to that with this video, that there is something rotten going on in our government that a lot of it ties down, you know, not to special interest groups or your partisan, you know, your, your, your partisan pet peeve or whatever. It is a combination of structurally entrenched power, say, through... Uh, gerrymandering, redistricting, all that sort of uh, stuff, and money in politics. That if we could fix even one of these, things could be a lot better. If we fix both of them, holy smokes, our government will actually serve us, as opposed to treat us as a resource to be distributed. And I don't know about you, but I'm a very big fan of democracy. I believe strongly in its you know, core ideals. And I also believe that we need, as a people always need to be searching to improve on our democracy, to you know, make it more you know, actionable to our needs as a, as, a, as a society. And so it is kind of the reason I wanted to make this video. It's also kind of the reason it took so long is I, I kind of went back and forth on several uh, bits I want to talk about and also wanted to make some cool maps. <laughs> Uh, Dave's registering app, fantastic stuff. Um, but yeah, so I'd like to thank you very much for joining me for this little uh, essay video, and I hope you'll uh, look at his reform efforts. So what I'm going to cover next? Well, let's check out what's on uh, YouTube. Oh, oh yeah, it's um, it's it's a it's primary season. Maybe I should make an endorsement, I guess.